The F-35, the pinnacle of stealth technology. It can destroy enemy targets before they even know it's there. But how did we get to this point? This episode is all about stealth. Real stealth technology began in the Cold War. The USA and the Soviet Union were locked in a battle to gain influence and control around the world. With this came the arms race and the space race, both sides making incredible efforts to gain the upper hand with new technologies. But to gain that upper hand over enemies, you need to know what they're doing. In the 1950s, that was easier said than done. The Soviet Union had a complex network of radar stations and anti-air missiles. It was an impregnable fortress. So the United States had Lockheed build a new surveillance aircraft. It was a job for the company's Skunk Works, their team in charge of advanced developments. The U-2 wasn't fast or stealthy, but it could fly above radar and missile defenses. It was flown over the Soviet Union, China, Vietnam, and Cuba. But it turned out the Americans had underestimated the Soviet radar. They'd been tracking it since day one and were quietly designing a missile that could shoot it down. In 1960, pilot Gary Powers was shot down in a CIA U-2 over the Soviet Union. He ejected and survived, but it was an embarrassment for the West and Gary Powers was paraded around the Soviet Union as evidence of Western aggression. For the Americans, even before one was shot down, it was clear they would need a long-term replacement for the U-2. But now they needed it more than ever. The job fell to aeronautical and systems engineer Kelly Johnson, who led Lockheed's Skunk Works. The team got their name because their first offices were nearly uninhabitable due to the smell from a nearby plastic factory. But the aircraft the team at Skunk Works developed was an incredible feat of engineering. And even today, it looks like something from the future. It combined high altitude with speed and stealth, the only combination that could make flying safely over the Soviet Union possible. The iconic SR-71, the Mach 3 spy plane flown in America that existed really in the 60s, that was the beginning of stealth. The SR-71, built for the US Air Force, could fly at Mach 3.2 at altitudes of more than 85,000 feet. A Blackbird at top speed was moving at nearly 2,500 miles per hour. What was exceptional about the, the Blackbird was its engine. Uh, it was developed with an engine that could fly on afterburner for a very long time. Now, Rich Graham, the SR-71 pilot that we have on display in the museum and who flew this aircraft behind me, describes it as if you've got a garden hose and you put your thumb over the end of the hose, the water goes much quicker. And it's effectively the engine, the J-58, which is behind me over there, that had that ability to always be on that powerful stream that made it go so fast. So this is still the fastest air-breathing jet ever made. Uh, and here's a look at the engines that, that made that possible. There's some really awesome graffiti in here. On the inside of where the landing gear goes, you can see people's names, crew. Lockheed engineers were innovating in all areas of the aircraft's design. Its shape, designed for extreme aerodynamics, happened to reduce radar signature as did its black paint, which was only there to help decrease its temperature. The cockpit got so hot during flight that pilots used to warm their meals up by pressing them against the glass. After it landed, the metal would contract, leaving gaps that fuel would leak out of. And Blackbird pilots wore helmets and orange suits, making them look more like astronauts. The whole aircraft was made out of titanium, as aluminium would lose its strength at high temperatures. To get the titanium, 
the CIA had to do underground deals with the USSR, the very country the plane was being made to spy on. The SR-71 Blackbird proved to be untouchable, and its speed records still haven't been beaten today. When they flew over Vietnam, more than 800 anti-air missiles were fired at them, to no effect. And although it officially never flew through Soviet airspace, it flew around the country's borders, with powerful side-facing cameras and radar gathering intel. At the time, the Blackbird was unbeatable. It flew above the Soviet MiG-25's max altitude. They could fly as fast, but only for a few minutes, whereas the Blackbird could cruise for hours at Mach 3. In the 80s, the MiG-31, along with new surface-to-air missiles, started to reduce the Blackbird's impunity. But a Blackbird was never shot down. In the end, it became a victim of reliability and cost, not the enemy catching up. 12 out of 32 Blackbirds were destroyed in accidents. And satellites and unmanned drones could be used for gathering intelligence. The cost of keeping such an aircraft operational, with the support that goes with it, was just too high. The US started to consider its defence spending and started to consider whether the Blackbird was still very viable to run. Arguments against it were it was so costly to maintain an aircraft like this. It was also the fact that new technologies had started to develop. Satellites could achieve what Blackbirds could. And as we've seen recently, new aircraft and uh, new unmanned aerial vehicles like the Predator behind me were coming to the fore as methods of reconnaissance. The future of manned stealth aircraft wasn't in reconnaissance, but instead as a tool for future fighters and ground attack. Enter Skunkworks next project. In 1975, engineers at Lockheed Skunk Works found a way to decrease radar signature. Instead of trying to fly above radar or outpace enemy aircraft, Lockheed turned their attention to beating radar itself. To understand how, we need to know how radar works. Radar sends out electromagnetic energy pulses. When they hit something like an aircraft, they bounce back being picked up by a receiver. This returning signal is called an echo. The bigger the echo, the bigger the aircraft. Radar sets use the echo to determine the direction and distance of the reflecting object or aircraft. Ironically, a Russian researcher was to thank for the concept of beating radar. A 1964 scientific paper had elaborated on the concept that visibility on radar was not based only on the size of an object, but also the angle at which radar waves reflected off its edges. The Russian researcher had devised a method for calculating the radar cross-section of objects, determining how visible they are on radar. The research paper had been read by an engineer at Skunk Works. The team at Lockheed were the first to create an aircraft that reflected away radar an aircraft built from the ground up for stealth. The result was a jet that looked unlike any other. The F-117 Nighthawk. Very simply, if I'm looking at a flat surface at right angles to the radar, if something like this were one square meter, it would have a radar return of a thousand square meters. If I move it back just about eight degrees, not very much, it drops from a thousand square meters to one square meter. And if I move it down to a very shallow angle, like about 20 degrees to horizontal, it's now down to one ten millionth of what it was when it was up there. The Nighthawk was aerodynamically unstable in all three axes and required constant flight corrections from a fly-by-wire flight system. And early stealthy aeroplanes weren't like modern ones, i.e. a blended aircraft fuselage design. It was all flat surfaces, if you remember, and the flat surfaces were to, when a radar signal hit it, it reflected it away or absorbed it. You design the aeroplane first off from a stealth viewpoint and you have to make high compromises on the aerodynamic design. 
But if you want a stealthy aeroplane with the features you see on a stealthy aeroplane, twin fins, um, highly agile in pitch, um, good quality handling, approach and landing, then you must go to an electronic fly-by-wire system, which is programmable, programmable with speed, height, probably weight of the aeroplane. You can program it to with characteristic changes in flight, with whatever variables you want to suit the task. Um, you must have a fly-by-wire system that makes up for that. The two prototypes earned the nickname Wobbly Goblins, and both crashed during testing. But soon after, in 1981, the first F-117A had rolled off the production lines. In total, 64 were built. In addition to its reflective surfaces, the Nighthawk sported other design features, now standard in stealth aircraft. Radar-absorbent iron ball paint, magnetically charged to reduce the reflection of electromagnetic waves slit-shaped exhaust ports to minimise the infrared signature of the exhaust. The Nighthawk carried no radar, because the radars of the time were easily detected. It even had communication antennas that could be retracted to reduce radar signature. Its weapons, all two of them, were stored in an internal bomb bay. You're flying along stealthy and clean. When you want to deploy the bomb, you open the doors, punch the bombs out and close the doors again. Obviously, the Nighthawk wasn't invisible to the eye, so it was painted black and flown exclusively at night. In 1990, the F-117 Nighthawk was used in the first Gulf War, where they flew 1,300 sorties and scored direct hits on 1,600 high-value targets in Iraq. Only 2.5% of the American aircraft in Iraq were Nighthawks, Yet they struck 40% of the strategic targets, dropping 2,000 tonnes of precision-guided munitions and striking their targets with an 80% success rate. But the F-117 wasn't perfect. 1999, somewhere over Yugoslavia. The F-117 was widely seen as one of the most advanced pieces of US military equipment. At the same time, Yugoslav air defences were considered relatively obsolete but the Yugoslav army managed to hit one of the stealth bombers with an anti-air missile. It said the troops spotted the aircraft on radar when its bomb bay doors opened, raising its radar signature. The next generation of stealth aircraft would need to be as aerodynamic and as manoeuvrable as conventional fighters. Advances in computers have made that possible. Supercomputers now calculate the ideal shapes for stealth aircraft, meaning that the flat surfaces are gone, replaced by smooth lines and curves, but crucially, still reflecting away radar. It was technology seen first on the B-2 bomber. The Nighthawk's first generation stealth technology limited its roles and capability, but decades of advancements have pushed the envelope further. It was retired in 2008, in part due to the introduction of the F-22 Raptor, a stealth fighter developed by Skunk Works that can also carry weapons for ground attack. The F-117, that black, really aggressive shaped aircraft, was the best of what technology knew at the day. So little black airplane, wasn't very maneuverable, had to fly at night, but we understood a lot about coatings of the aircraft, about shaping, and we evolved into the F-22 and we kept retained that very low observable characteristic, but put it in an aircraft that was a monster to fly, remarkably maneuverable, extraordinarily powerful. Before the Raptor, stealth aircraft didn't have afterburners or reheat because the hot exhaust would increase their infrared footprint and flying faster than the speed of sound would produce an obvious sonic boom. As a result, their performance in air combat would never match that of a dedicated fighter. New design techniques allow for stealthy designs like the F-22 without compromising aerodynamic performance. They've got a true fighter now, a blended body, which is stealthy and can be up there fighting with any aircraft in the world. And don't forget, when you 
when you dogfight, if you have to dogfight in modern aeroplanes and pulling 8, 9G, you really have lost the plot. You should have taken that aeroplane out at long range in a stealthy mode. The F-35 borrows much of that stealth technology from the F-22. It combines advanced stealth with fighter speed and agility. The F-35 is a product of 40 years of manufacturing different generations of very low observable aircraft. And it's not just the shaping. Every emission that comes out of our aircraft, radios if you will, our sensors, we control every part of that. The heat at the back of the engine of ours, we control that. We know every part of what's happening behind us so we can understand whether we're highlighting ourselves in the heat regime, in the infrared regime, not just whether we could be seen by a radar as an example. That's a whole different mindset of what stealth is than people typically would think. It's every duct, fastener, opening on the aircraft is positioned or placed in, in a way that you're never going to contaminate that Harry Potter cloak of invisibility type of scenario that we have. The F-35's radar absorbent materials are designed to be more durable and require less maintenance than those from previous stealth aircraft, but it's still a product with a big price tag. When we studied F-35, we studied the illities, affordability, sustainability, uh, survivability, maintainability until it came out of the yin yangs because if you're not careful the price of these jets will run away such that the customer will say i can't afford it anymore it's already a mute point trump has complained like it mad about the cost of the f-35 and it's not a cheap jet one of the interesting things is you you don't believe in stealth until you've flown with it or flown against it it's really difficult in a fourth generation fighter where you see, essentially see everyone in your formation to hear this voice from on high, from some place that you can't understand, some ghost out there, someone in an F-35, you have no idea where he or she is, but the little voice tells you where to go and, and what's happening out there. That's when you start to believe in what the power of what stealth is all about. For many countries, it's the first stealth capability they've ever had. Stealth was once an exclusive asset, evidence of American aviation prowess, futuristic jets that kids would build models of. It was technology developed and kept secret by a small group of scientists and engineers at Lockheed Martin. The Skunk Works was an investment by the US government. It, it was, a, for them, an excellent investment in technology. It's something we've never been able to do and never been able to afford. U2 and especially SR-71 broke the barriers because they were scientists and engineers and could do it. And they could do it without any red tape and they didn't have to tell the world. And there was a specialist group of them, highly enthusi enthusiastic. And you can only do that in those environments because if you go through the bureaucracy of an MOD procurement plan to do that, you'd never get it done. The same with the bureaucracy of a, a program through the Pentagon, you'd never get it done. So you need to shut the engineers away, keep away the bureaucrats, give them lots of money, lots of hamburgers, and in the end you'll get a product. And we've not, in the UK, we've never been able to do it. And so, good luck to them. Stealth aircraft are now worldwide. Countries have bought into an international political project that, yes, has been late and over budget, but it's a project that allowed them to take a shortcut. Getting stealth technology to where it is now took decades of investment. And those secrets that started in a skunkworks hangar in Palmdale, California, are now available for a price to governments around the world. Thanks for watching. Intel releases every month on this channel, and this season is all about the technologies used in the F-35. So subscribe for more like this. The next video in this series is all about short takeoff and vertical landing.